Karen, maybe I can. I'm just, maybe, okay, maybe okay. Karen, I can, uh, I can, uh, I can do some introductory remarks and then give you the floor. Is that okay with you? Sure, sure, sure. sure. Yes. Yeah. So welcome everyone uh, to this uh, session on uh, Fichte. Um, before introducing the speakers, I would like to make some um, uh, comments uh, of a practical nature as normal. Uh, so um, uh, as you probably know, um, we would like to ask you to switch on uh, the, the camera if possible. And uh, during the discussion to uh, raise your uh, hand by using the raise hand icon. Um, and um, I would also like to ask you to keep your questions uh, short and focused. So now I'd like to uh, introduce and welcome uh, the speakers. And this is a great pleasure um, to me. Uh, so first of all, um, uh, Karen Niesenbaum and uh, Julia Peters, uh, who will uh, jointly uh, give their talk. Uh, Karen Niesenbaum is assistant professor at Syracuse University, and her areas of research are Kant, German idealism, and Jewish thought. She has published on Kant, Maimon, and Schelling, among other philosophers, and she is the author of For the Love of Metaphysics, Nihilism, and the Conflict of Reason from Kant to Rosenzweig, which was published in 2018 with uh, Oxford. Uh, Julia Peters is associate professor at the University of Tübingen, and her publications deal with virtue ethics, aesthetics, Hegel, and Kant's practical philosophy. And she's the author of Hegel on Beauty, published in 2015 with Routledge. Uh, so uh, Karen and uh, Julia will talk for about 40 minutes, and their talk will be followed by a response from uh, Luca van der Soe, who has kindly agreed to act as a commentator and who is a professor at the University of Pavia. Uh, Luca von der Soe is a specialist in German, Kant, uh, German philosophy, Kant and uh, German idealism, and he has published extensively on Fichte's practical philosophy in particular, uh, but also on many other uh, subjects. His monographs include Per una moralita concreta Studi sulla filosofia classica tedesca, published in 2010. So um, um, I also wanted to mention that after the Q&A, uh, we'll leave, leave open the Zoom meeting for uh, informal uh, conversations. And the title of uh, the talk by Karen and Julia is Fichte on the Puzzle of Self-Transformation. Please, mm -hmm. Karen. Um, so first, I want to thank um, Karin de Boer <laughs> um, for inviting us um, to give this talk. Um, Julie and I have been uh, working on this together. Um, it's you know still a work in progress, so we're very much looking forward to your um, to your feedback on this. Um, we did, in the course of writing the paper, change the title a little bit. <laughs> um, so it's now Fake Down Moral Development and Transformation because we realize there's um, you know, different be difference between the idea of, of development and transformation as we were originally thinking about it. Um, so I'll let Julia say a few words as well. Yes, thank you. So I also would like to thank Karin for having us over. It's a great pleasure to be here and it's a great opportunity for us to try out this work in progress that we, are, that we re recently started. And I also would like to thank Luca for reading our paper and preparing a, a response to it. Um, so there's a handout um, which is available in the chat if you would like to open it so that the handout contains all of the quotations we'll be using and it has the quotations both in English and in German, though we will only be reading the English version during the talk. Okay, I think with that I just hand over to Karin. Okay, everybody can hear me well, right? Yeah, okay, great. Okay. So um, in this paper, we address a question of how, on Fichte's account, human subjects become full-grown, mature moral agents or selves. Our thesis is that there's a close connection between Fichte's conception of freedom and his notion of moral development. This is because for Fichte, the quintessential act of freedom is reflection rather than choice. Reflection, however, has a complex double-faced structure for Fichte. From the point of view of the subject who is undergoing moral development, it consists simply in the process of conceptually grasping and representing an end or drive that she already has. 
From the point of the onlooking philosopher, however, the process of the subjects moving through different stages of, re of reflection has a form of a transcendental argument. Insofar as it is shown that a different end or drive is a condition for the subject to conceptually grasp and represent the drives actually governing her. Specifically in this process, the adoption of the moral end, the end of following the moral law for its own sake is a necessary condition of reflection. Thus the adoption of a different end and specifically of the essential moral end appears from the point of view of the subject as a transformative act of adopting a radically novel set of ends that fails to stand in continuity with one's previous set. This act of transformation, furthermore, is, is usually inspired by some external stimulus, such as a perception of a moral exemplar. From the point of view of the philosopher, however, it is merely a logical and necessary implication of the act of reflection itself. Accordingly, like the act of reflection itself, the process of becoming a moral agent has two essential modes of appearance for Fichte, as development in the literal sense of the German word Entwicklung and as transformation. For the sake of this presentation, we focus mainly on section 16 of the Sittenlehre. Apart from trying to reconstruct Fichte's position as a self-standing view, we are also interested in how Fichte compares to Kant. Given how central the Kantian notion of freedom and self-determination are for Fichte's moral philosophy, it is intriguing to see how much he diverges from Kant when one, look, when one looks at the details of his position, or so we argue. What becomes clear very early on is that for Fichte, human subjects become mature moral selves by way of a process that unfolds in time. While Kant in his main critical works on practical philosophy, including the groundwork, crit critique of practical reason and religion within the boundaries of mere reason, begins from an analysis of rational agents who are already conscious of the moral law. Fichte in his system of ethics shows how human beings gradually progress through various stages of moral development and ultimately become conscious of the moral law. First are governed by a natural drive that aims only at enjoyment and has pleasure as, as its incentive. Then they're governed by a heroic drive or a drive for absolute self-sufficiency, whose aim is the unrestricted and lawless dominion over everything outside us. Lastly, they're governed by the moral law, which command us to do always and in every case what duty demands because duty demands it. It is worth noting that when Fichte describes these stages or steps that lead up to the emergence of the full grown moral self, he is describing an actual development, not just giving a successive analysis. While it is uncontroversial that Fichte provides this developmental account of moral agency, little work has been done to clarify how exactly Fichte understands what transpires in each state of, stage of development. Fichte says that ascending toward a higher stage of moral development requires reflecting on the drives that govern us in a lower stage. Yet it is not at all clear what reflection involves, nor how it enables us to ascend toward, toward higher stages of moral development. Thus, while our central aim is to reconstruct the different stages of, of Fichte's successive account of moral agency, a second and closely related aim is to clarify what reflection involves. And now I hand it over to Julia. Okay, Fichte on freedom and reflection. So we want to begin with a brief comparison between Kant's and Fichte's respective understanding of the nature of freedom in order to then introduce what we believe is essential to Fichte's account of freedom as reflection. And we will see that we'll, this will have important implications that we will come back to at different points in our discussion. So for Kant, leaving a lot of difficulties and subtleties aside, obviously, one can say that freedom consists in making the spontaneous choice to determine oneself in accord with the law of pure practical re reason. So it's, it's about freedom is about choice. In doing so, one also chooses not to prioritize one's inclinations over the moral law. So for, uh, for Kant, Freedom essentially involves the choice of a practical option, of an incentive, as Kant would call it. Now, by contrast, on our interpretation for Fichte, the essential free act is not to choose between incentives, but actually to reflect on our drives. So reflection for Fichte 
is the fundamental act of thought through which self-consciousness is constituted. It is the act of the self-thinking itself, of the self-thinking itself. So it's this fundamentally, fundamental self-constituting act. And this act of reflection for Fichte is spontaneous in the sense that it cannot be grounded in or brought about by anything external to itself. So only I can think myself, just as only I can say I to myself. So that's one of Fichte's central idea. And this is what makes reflection the quintessential act of freedom, this idea of spontaneity, of be not being grounded in anything uh, outside of itself. Now, analyzing Fichte's a kind of reflection more closely in the context of his practical philosophy, where the objects of reflection are ends or drives, I actually think we should say are ends, the object of reflection are ends, uh, sorry, are drives, and by reflecting on them, they become ends. So by analyzing this idea in the context of his practical philosophy, when we can distinguish the following elements in it. First, when we reflect on a drive, the immediate satisfaction of the drive is suspended. Second, in reflecting on our drives, drives are turned into maxims. It's a Kantian term that Fichte inherits. They are turned into maxim, a maxims that is they assume a conceptual that is general form. And the material content of the maxim or the material end that is being pursued is contributed by the drive. And through the act of reflection, this material content assumes a conceptual form. Now this in turn introduces the possibility of choosing between different means of satisfying the drive. So one can say that here choice arises as a consequence of, or is enabled by the fundamental act of freedom, namely reflection, rather than itself constituting freedom as the, the Kantian account would have it. Third, the act of reflection in the sense just characterized would not be possible, that's Fichte's view, would not be possible unless it were in fact accompanied by a different material end or drive, the drive towards absolute independence or selfhood. So different from the drive that we are reflecting on. And so insofar as a subject can reflect on the drives that are actually governing her, she must already be driven at the same time by a different and novel drive. A drive that is that arises from her nature as a reflective sponta spontaneous self-thinking subject. But this latter fact, importantly, may not be known to her. So it's a necessary implication of her reflective act, but it, she may not be aware of this fact. So the first two aspects of reflection that I just mentioned comprise what Fichte also refers to as the formal aspect of freedom. The third aspect, this idea that a new novel drive is being implied by the act of reflection, the third aspect constitutes what Fichte refers to as, the ma as material freedom. So on our interpretation, then material freedom constitutes a presupposition for, or condition for the possibility of formal freedom. There's no formal freedom without reflective freedom or, um, sorry, without material freedom. Okay, so that's as a, just a preliminary sketch of Fichte's conception of freedom as reflection. And against this background, we now want to offer a sketch of the process of how it is that human subjects become full-fledged moral agents on Fichte's account. And in light of what I just said, we can anticipate that this process is driven forward by the reiteration of the act of reflection. So each new stage in this development or um, succession is ushered in by a novel act of reflection and its implications. Okay, so I come to this uh, successive account of becoming a moral agent. And we're starting with the first stage. We call it the first act of reflection. I think this idea is that we start as a subject, who, or we all start as a subject, who has the natural drive to maximize pleasure. And when the subject now reflects on this drive, this drive is turned into a maxim, namely the maxim of happiness. So at this stage, we have the material drive to pursue pleasure conceptualized and turned into a maxim, the maxim of happiness. But now comes the really interesting move. 
So by reflecting on the drive to pleasure and turning it into a maxim, Fichte says, we also come to adopt a new material end or a new drive. And in this particular case, I think one can think about it in this way. Before the first act of reflection, you might say there, was, there were just drives, not really a self who distinguishes herself from these drives. So you might think of it as a kind of like a, um, an animal mind, a, mind a, a, a creature that is kind of constituted by her drives, nothing apart from, from its drives. Now, through reflection, the self comes into being as something distinct from its drives. But with the self comes the drive that is the material end to maintain and sustain the self as something that is distinct from its drive. And this is then what Fichte calls a drive to absolute independence. Okay, so this is the first stage of um, reflection, first stage of reflection reflecting on our natural material drives. Okay, now comes the second act of reflection. Because reflection is necessarily accompanied by a drive to independence, as we just saw, it is also possible for this drive to occur in the form of a mere or blind drive, which is pursued in a kind of unthinking, non-reflective way. And when this happens, Fichte calls the drive in question the heroic drive. Now, from Fichte's text, it can seem as if he thinks that this stage of a blind drive to independence is almost like a necessary natural stage that we all have to move through in our moral development. But we believe that this would be too strong an assumption. We believe that all that Fichte wants to claim here is that the complete detachment of the drive to independence from its check through reflective thought is a possible stage in a subject's moral development. So one might think here, for instance, of the stage of adolescence as a period in actual human psychological development where such a detachment of the drive to independence from a critical reflection typically takes place. So that this often happens in actual human development, but the drive to independence need not necessarily man manifest itself in this blind and unthinking way. Instead, the emergence of the matu new material end of independence can also be simultaneously accompanied by an act of reflection as well. So this would be the kind of reiteration of the act of reflection, the second act of reflection. And once this has occurred, we have in fact reached the stage of proper moral agency for Fichte. So the subject now pursues the material end of absolute independence, but this end now does not occur as a blind drive, but rather the subject takes it up into her maxim because she considers herself to be under the command of an unconditional absolute law to do so. So instead of a, in the form of a drive, it presents itself in the form of a law. So here's a passage where Fichte describes this process. And this is, I believe, quotation number one on your handout. So Fichte says, a human being has only to raise to clear consciousness this drive to absolute self-sufficiency which, when it operates as a blind drive, produces a very immoral character, a heroic character. And then, as was shown earlier, simply by means of this very act of reflection, this same drive will transform itself within him into an absolutely commanding law. Now, at this stage, Fichte points out a potential deviant path in the moral subject's development, namely evil. So evil occurs when we have in principle reached the stage of proper moral motivation, but we deviate from it. And Fichte gives us a, a clue as to how this deviation can happen. So as we have seen, liberation happens through spontaneous reflection. And this on our reading is the quintessential act of freedom. Now, in order to maintain freedom, we need to continue and sustain this act of reflection. And this is something that we can, in fact, omit to do. So we can fail to do this. Here's uh, an, another quotation, quotation number two on the handout. For such consciousness, namely consciousness of the moral law, arises only through an act of absolute spontaneity, reflection, and it endures only through the continuation of the same act of freedom. Now, again, note that in his discussion of evil, Fichte indicates that his position 
in fact moves in the direction of what some contemporaneous interpreters of Kant called intelligible fatalism. That is the view that when we act from pure practical reason or out of respect for the moral law, we are determined to do so by our rational nature rather than freely choosing to act in this way. But Fichte explains that on his view, one can embrace determinism in a way without giving up freedom because he states that as long as we properly reflect on the law, we cannot but act in accord with it. When we stop reflecting on it, we cannot act in accord with it. So this is what he actually says about evil. Um, we have no choice either way. When we are in full awareness of the moral law, we cannot but act in accord with it. Um, when, we, when we're not in awareness of the moral law, we cannot act in accord with it. And this makes sense in light of our interpretation of Fichte's account of freedom as sketched above, because on our view, freedom for Fichte is not a question of choice, but of reflection, and reflection is the quintessential act of freedom. So if one has carried out the act of reflection that leads to proper awareness of the moral law, one is thereby free. Such freedom does not involve the ability to choose between different practical options. Okay. I come to the next section, the incomprehensibility of moral development and transformation. Let's now return to the question of what precisely is involved in the act of reflection that moves us from one stage of moral development to the next. So we saw that a central issue here is precisely how we are to understand this generative or transformative power of reflection what I above described as stage three in the process of reflection, how it is that the mere act of reflection can generate something like a novel drive, a novel material end. One way of bringing this issue and this question into sharper focus is by way of considering Fichte's claim that the sort of self-transformation that leads to moral development is in some sense incomprehensible, he said. Consider, for example, the following passage, and this should be uh, quotation number three in the handout. There's something incomprehensible here, and it cannot be otherwise, since we are now standing at the boundary of all comprehensibility, namely the doctrine of freedom as it applies to the empirical subject. So long as I do not yet occupy a higher standpoint of reflection, then this standpoint does not exist for me, and hence I cannot have a concept of what I am supposed to do before I actually do it. So Fichte is here speaking, we believe, about the ascent to reflection as such. So how it is that we can start reflecting? How do we come to reflect? For example, he's considering how someone who is governed by the natural life and has as his maxim to choose that which promises the greatest pleasure can come to occupy a higher level of moral development, one in which he begins to ask himself what he ought to do. Yet it's not entirely clear how Fichte understands the nature of this incomprehensibility. At times, it seems that what he says about this is very Kantian. Um, Yeah, so in his religion within the boundaries of mere reason, Kant considers how a human being chooses between good or evil. And he argues that this choice, whether wise one chooses one and one chooses the other is inexplicable. And his reason for this is twofold. On the one hand, any attempt to explain this choice as a free choice would lead to an infinite regress of explanation. There is a quotation uh, on the handout from the religion, which is a footnote actually in the, in the religion text, um, but I'm not going to read that now. If you want to, you can, uh, you can look it up. So in other words, any free choice requires a reason or ground that can be described by a maxim. Yet if I wish to explain my choice of a fundamental evil or good maxim, I need to do that by adducing another maxim. And I wish to, if I wish to explain my choice of that maxim, I need to cite yet another maxim and so on at infinitum. On the other hand, I can't avoid this infinite regress of maxims by presenting some natural incentive as the reason or ground for my choice because then the choice would not be free. I would instead be determined by my nature. And Fichte in fact seems to suggest something like this Kantian view in the following passage. 
where he says that reflecting on the drive that governs us, so the first step in the process of moral development, is an act of freedom that cannot be explained or comprehended. So this is quotation, I kind of lost track now, but I think it's quotation number four. <laughs> Comprehend means to connect one act of thinking to another act of thinking, to think the former by means of the latter. It's therefore absolutely contradictory to want to comprehend an act of freedom. Were we able to comprehend it then, precisely for this reason, it would not be freedom. And in fact, Fichte refers in this context to Kant's claims concerning the incomprehensibility of evil in, in the religion. Yeah, we should note that on Fichte's view, what is incomprehensible is the very act of reflection, which first makes available the higher standpoint and the possibility of being governed by any maxims, moral and immoral. By contrast, on Kant's view, what is incomprehensible is a choice between two different maxims that are already available to me as possible sources of motivation, that is evil and good, um, or moral maxims. For this reason, the problem of an infinite regress of maxims does not seem to affect the Fichtian picture. I'm not choosing between two possible maxims, which would require that I adduce another maxim as the reason or ground for my choice, but I'm simply reflecting on the drive that currently governs me, which first turns it into a maxim. Thus, we propose that, at least in this passage, Fichte describes the act of freely reflecting on our drives as incomprehensible, not because he's concerned about the possibility of an infinite regress of maxims, as Kant might be, but in order to emphasize that the act of reflection is absolutely spontaneous or absolute in the sense of uncaused by anything outside of itself. Okay, now I hand over to Karin again. Okay, so nonetheless, um, there's a different reason why Fichte believes that freely reflecting on our drives is incomprehensible. Um, and this is what led to the original title of our paper on the puzzle of self-transformation. Um, and this derives from the standpoint that the person who is undergoing moral development occupies. So let us return to the passage that Julia cited previously, where Fichte says that the act of reflecting on our drives is incomprehensible. For as Fichte says, so long as I do not yet occupy a higher standpoint of reflection, then this standpoint does not exist for me. And hence I cannot have a concept of what I am supposed to do before I actually do it. We would like to propose that the source of the incomprehensibility here is the fact that the act of reflection is transformative, at least from the standpoint of the person undergoing moral development. If I am the person undergoing moral development, then the act of reflection radically alters and even forces me to abandon my antecedent desires and preferences. So it is difficult to see how, when I occupy the standpoint in which I am governed by those desires and preferences, I can choose to embark on a process that leads me to abandon them. For example, if I occupy the standpoint in which I'm governed by the natural drive, whose sole aim is pleasure or enjoyment, what could motivate me to acquire a completely different set of desires, say the desire for absolute self-sufficiency? especially when this new set of desires threatens my antecedent desires, and when I can't foresee what it will be like to have this new set of desires and preferences. Agnes Callard's recent work on the nature of aspiration helps to bring the puzzle of self-transformation into focus. Um, so as she explains, in cases of genuine self-transformation, the subject is not fully equipped with the resources to appreciate and value the person she is making herself into. For example, I might decide to become a mother, despite my current preference for solitude and despite my desire to be in control of my own time and emotional resources. Given these preferences and desires, it's difficult to see how I can be in the position to appreciate and value all that motherhood involves. Cases of genuine self-transformation are thus different from cases of self-cultivation. For in cases of self-cultivation, the person can already foresee and approve of the changes in desires and preferences that new habits or forms of life will occasion. In cases of self-cultivation, persons change themselves in ways that are driven by their current preferences. They believe that certain changes in habits or styles of life 
will help to satisfy, support, or further develop those same preferences. For example, I might um, adopt a plant-based diet as a way to strengthen my current commitment to eat healthily and to protect, protect the environment. There's no mystery in that case. Yet as Kellard asks, what could possibly ground a preference changing decision if those preferences do not support, but rather threaten one's basic antecedent preference structure? How can we understand cases of genuine self-transformation? Big dissolution to this puzzle is that self-transformation, or at least the form of self-transformation that, that transpires during moral development, is possible because it is a change from what we are to what we ought to be. And we recognize what we ought to be by observing the example of others. Consider the following passage where Fichte describes how someone gets out of the state of habitual inertia, which is how Fichte understands the source of evil. And I'm going to cite this, um, read this passage. It's number six on the handout. Um, so he says, what is lacking is not the force um, to get himself out of the state of inertia, which he surely possesses, but the consciousness of this force and the stimulus to use it. For reasons that have already been stated, this stimulus cannot come from inside. As long as the stimulus in question is supposed to arise through natural means and not through a miracle, then it has to come from outside. A human being could receive such a stimulus only through his understanding and through his entire theoretical power, which can surely be cultivated. The individual would have to see himself in his contemptible shape and feel disgust toward himself. He would have to see exemplars who will elevate him and provide him with an image of how he ought to be who infuse him with respect, along with a desire to become worthy of respect himself. There is no other path towards cultivation. This path provides us with what we was previously missing, consciousness and a stimulus. So this form of moral transformation involves the following elements. First, a natural force or innate capacity to tear oneself loose from the drives or ends that we currently have, at least when those desires don't align with those we ought to have. Second, consciousness of this force or innate capacity. For example, in the transition from the first to the second stages of moral development, we become conscious of our capacity to distance ourselves from the natural drive to maximize pleasure. Third, a stimulus that both creates consciousness of this force and prompts us to use it. And Fichte holds us this stimulus must come from outside. It cannot come from inside. It generates contempt and disgust toward our old self and the, and the desire to elevate and transform it on the model of certain exemplars that we perceive. It's important to note that in this passage, Fichte speaks of cultivation, though, not transformation. Yet one of the interesting aspects of Fichte's account of moral growth is that he switches back and forth between the perspective of the, of the onlooking philosopher who understands and explains the process of moral development and the perspective of the subject who undergoes this development. From the perspective of the onlooking philosopher, moral growth involves self-cultivation. From the perspective of the subject undergoing moral growth, it, it involves self-transformation. So let us focus first on the perspective of the philosopher. The philosopher knows what our true nature is. And she expects that we will realize our true nature by reflecting on our drives and ascending the ladder of moral development until we adopt the moral end, the end of following the moral law for its own sake, or of doing what duty demands because duty demands it. Victor suggests this view at the start of section 16, when he says that according to the moral law, an empirical temporal being is supposed to become an exact copy of the original I or when he says that reflection is to be expected because the empirical eye ought to correspond to the pure eye. Now, Fichte's account of the relationship between the empirical eye and the original eye is very complex, um, and a detailed discussion of this discussion is beyond the scope of this paper. But for present purposes, it suffices to note that for Fichte, um, this distinction between the empirical eye and the original eye should not be understood in metaphysical terms, but rather in normative terms. The original I is not numerically distinct from us, but rather represents the perfect realization of our own higher nature, what originally constitutes us as rational beings. 
So in his lectures on the vocation of scholars, Fichte describes a char char characteristic feature of the pure or original I as that of absolute unity. Thus, if we're to become like the pure I, we must also unify ourselves. And I'll briefly read the passage where he says this, which is seven on the handout. Um, the pure I can be represented only negatively as the opposite of the not I. The characteristic feature of the latter is multiplicity and thus the characteristic feature of the former is complete and absolute unity. The pure I is always one and the same and is never anything different. Thus we may express the above formula, man ought to be what he is simply because he is as follows. Man is always supposed to be at one with himself, he should never contradict himself. So Fichte thinks that we unify ourselves by acting in accordance with the moral law, which Fichte formulates as follows, never will things that contradict each other. Crucially, Fichte also thinks that realizing our nature also involves con constituting ourselves as self-conscious beings, conceptually grasping that we are beings capable of adopting the moral end and being governed by the ethical drive. And as we mentioned in our opening remarks, we constitute ourselves as self-conscious beings through, through reflection, the quintessential act of freedom. Now, because a philosopher knows what our true nature is and what the ultimate aim of reflection is, again, to constitute ourselves as self-conscious beings capable of adopting the moral end, she can construe the initial act of reflecting on our, nature, on our natural drive, which initiates the process of moral development as an implicit grasp of and commitment to the moral end. Earlier, we explained this point by saying that from the perspective of the onlooking philosopher, the process of the subjects moving through different stages of reflection has a form of transcendental argument. In so far it has shown that a different and or drive is a condition for the subject to conceptually grasp and represent the drives actually governing her. And again, more specifically, the adoption of the moral end the end of following the moral law for its own sake is a necessary condition of reflection. So this shows why from the perspective of the onlooking philosopher, moral growth involves self-cultivation and not self-transformation. So the philosopher can perceive the initial act of reflecting as already a tacit appreciation of the moral end. From her perspective, there is no radical change in desires and preferences, but rather a gradual development, enrichment, and conscious grasp of the drives that the subject already has. The experience of the subject who is undergoing moral growth, however, is completely different. Fichte vividly describes a sort of tunnel vision that affects a person at the lowest level of moral development, which makes it seem impossible for them to get themselves out of that state. And what he says about this is worth, worth citing at length. Um, this is um, eight in the... Um, yeah, aid in the handout. Um, no balance is established here. Instead, there is, there's only the weight of his nature, which is what holds him in check. And there's no counterweight from the side of the moral law. It is indeed true that a human being absolutely ought to step onto the other side of the scale and decide this conflict. And it is also true that he actually possesses within himself the force to give himself as much weight as is necessary up to infinity in order to outweigh his own inertia, and that he can at any moment release this force from himself by putting pressure on himself through sheer will. But how is he ever supposed to arrive at this act of willing? And how does he first become able to place such pressure on himself? Such a state of willing by no means emerges from the state he is in, which instead yields the opposite state, one that holds him in check and fetters him. But where in his state is there a place from which he, can, he could produce this force? Absolutely nowhere. Only a miracle could save him, a miracle moreover, which he himself would have to per per perform. So in other words, even though the subject who is undergoing moral growth possesses the force or capacity to get themselves out of their state of inertia and ascend toward a higher stage of moral development, all they experience is that they're governed by the natural drive which has as its end pleasure or enjoyment. There is no other end in sight for the subject. So self-transformation is not really possible on Fichte's view. It can only transpire if the subject is presented with an exemplar, an image of another subject who exhibits the possibility of an entirely different set of desires, preferences, and motivations. 
The encounter with such an exemplar transforms a vision of the subject undergoing moral growth. They now see themselves from the perspective of the exemplar, feel disgust toward their old self and desire to become the self they ought to be. From the perspective of the subject, this change seems like a complete transformation in their motivational structure. From the perspective of the onlooking philosopher, however, the subject has simply become conscious of a motivation they already have, and they have been simulated to act in ways consistent with that motivation. Fichte describes the stimulus as a cultivation of our understanding, which again suggests that perceiving such exemplars enables us to recognize what we ought to be, something that we implicitly know all along. One question that might arise concerning Fichte's view is whether it results in a form of heteronomy. For except in cases where an individual is a genius of virtue, um, moral development requires a stimulus that comes from outside. Yet Fichte makes it very clear that the external stimulus cannot exercise any causality upon the individual. It is not they that operate in him and through him, as Fichte says, but it is he himself who determines himself in response to a stimulus from the latter. So we propose that the stimulus is more like an enabling material condition which allows us to cognize what we ought to be and which sparks a desire to be that way. Like the sensible conditions of cognition, it resembles, resembles the air that enables a dove to fly, a beautiful metaphor that um, Kant uses in the first critique. Um, so now I turn it over to Julia again for um, the conclusion of our talk. <clears throat> so we come to our conclusion. So we argued here that there is a close connection between Fichte's notion of freedom on the one hand and his understanding of the process of reaching moral maturity on the other. On our reading, the quintessential act of freedom for Fichte is reflection, while reflection is an act that can be looked at from two perspectives, from the perspective of the subject who carries out the act of reflection and from the perspective of the philosopher who inquires into, or might say, the underlying logic of reflection. By understanding freedom in Fichte as reflection and by distinguishing these two perspectives, we bring into view how Fichte's conception of freedom combines aspects of determinism and indeterminism. First, a subject can be free for Fichte even though her ends are determined by her drives. Her freedom consists in the fact that she has reflected on these drives if she has reflected on them, which in turn ensures that she has a choice of means rather than ends. Second, from the perspective of the onlooking philosopher, the complete set of a subject's ends are determined by her drives and by whether or not she has carried out the act of reflecting on those drives. By contrast, from the point of view of the subject undergoing moral development or transformation, some of the drives the subject actually has are hidden from her view. And the, conscious, the subject's conscious adoption of these drives as ends is the result of a process which the subject experiences as radical moral transformation. That is a step which is utterly undetermined by her preceding set of ends. Furthermore, Fichte's distinction between these two perspectives allows him on the one hand to make the process of moral maturation intelligible, perhaps even to justify the steps of moral development from the point of view of the developing subject, at least in hindsight, while at the same time leaving room for the appearance of genuine substantial transformation that comes with the process of reaching moral maturity, which seems phenomenologically crucial. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Julia and Karen, for your very interesting uh, talk. Uh, I now hand over uh, immediately to Luca for his comments. Well, thank, thank you very much. Thank you very much to Karin de Berg for the kind invitation. I'm very happy to be here. And thank you very much for the, for the paper and for the talk, because I read the paper, because, well, I work in Fichte since a long time, and, and this is actually a, a very original way of approaching this this important book, the most important book uh, uh, of Fichte concerning ethics and this section, because I think that you are completely right that section 16 and the 
philosophical economy of, of the uh, system of ethics uh, does play a, a crucial a crucial role uh, also because it translates so to speak with real figures or in real figures what uh, happened in the second part of the book uh, with the deduction of the reality and applicability of the principle of ethics that is that here fichte and and you say you have written that somewhere in the paper. Here, Fichte uh, uh, presents real figures uh, or real stages uh, of the Stufen, uh, steps uh, of the uh, consciousness, uh, which uh, or whose elements were presented uh, before as abstract elements, which were not parts of a story. And the question of the story is the, the, the central question here, because at the beginning, Fichte writes that this is the history of rational empirical being. And this is, in fact, the section 16 of the system of ethics, a proper history of consciousness uh, or phenomenology, we could also say, a phenomenology of freedom. Uh, in the, I would say, in the, the uh, para-Hegelian, uh, sense. It's not the, the only history of consciousness in, in Fichte's uh, intellectual biography, uh, but it's the first and the only one I would say that has to do with ethics. It is a phenomenology of freedom as phenomenology of moral, of moral consciousness. Uh, uh, the, the next one will be in the vocation of man, two years later, another phenomenology or history of consciousness in, in Fichte and philosophy, and then in the in the introduction to blessed life, 18 and, and six. And there are a lot of similarity between the, the Hegelian way to proceed in the history of consciousness and the Fichtian uh, way, but not for the Fichtian doctrine of science of 94, but exactly, I think, uh, in, this, in, this, uh, 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 in this book and in the other history of consci histories of consciousness, uh, which Fichte will, will, uh, uh, will write. And Hegel certainly read the system of ethics, because he criticized it in the very, in the usual, very strong <laughs> and sarcastic way in the in the in the Yena, in the Yena time. And the question is that the the the, the new title, uh, the Fichte moral development and transformation, and the, the connection between freedom and moral development. That is the. The, your central thesis, and I agree with the central thesis, which is also against another thesis of Owen Weir, uh, uh, about which or uh, that uh, does interpret freedom as freedom of choice, then I, I'll say something about that. But I think that the point, your point is substantially right. That is the, the central role of reflection. And that in, in this section, this central role of reflection explains moral development and explains how it is possible, or at least Fichte tries to explain how it is possible to have a moral development. A moral development which could be understood also in the, not only in the ontogenetic sense, but also in the phylogenetic sense. Because mm -hmm. for example, in the second part in the quoted, I think section nine or 10, uh, uh, the description of the first step, you know, the, the natural man uh, or the child, the natural human being is the primitive man. Uh, and this, in this sense, it is interesting to, to remark that uh, in Fichte's perspective, there is this kind of parallelism between uh, two different, so to speak, histories, the history of the, sing of the individual and the history of mankind. You know? Primitive man, uh, eudaimonistic era, and then maybe in the future the uh, moral era of of human of humankind. Um, the second important question, or the second important aspect, is the question of the of the points of view, the two points of view, points of view of the subject and points of and point, and point of view of the philosopher, another Hegelian or pre-Hegelian <laughs> uh, aspect, of course. Uh, which you develop in, with this, uh, also with this distinction between mm, uh, self-cultivation and self-transformation. Uh, my questions. The first is, does concern evil. 
which is of course one of the central problem uh, here also because I think, in my opinion at least, Fichte, as always, he mentions Kant when he disagrees with Kant. And when he disagrees with Kant, he says, well, I agree completely with Kant. This is a typical uh, Fichtean uh, <laughs> theoretical uh, uh, um, movement, I, I would say. And this is, this is exactly the case because uh, Fichte's uh, conception of evil is very weak, not in the uh, conceptual sense, weak in the sense that there is no dramatic mm, interpretation of evil. Evil is just an intellectual question, exactly because reflection uh, uh, is all better. The quintessential, uh, quintessential uh, 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 or the essence of freedom is reflection, then if I, I do not use freedom, I do not reflect. That's it. So that this, uh, this conception of evil and of evil as, as Fichte writes, inertia, no? the question is just uh, something that I do not enough or something that I do, I cannot, that I could, but I cannot do uh, 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 right now. And this is a strongly intellectualistic conception of evil which is maybe also a weakness in Fichte's uh, conception. Also, and this is the second question. The first question is if you agree with this conception of the dramatization, so to speak, of evil in, in, in Fichte's eyes. And the, the, the connected question is uh, the, the, the problem that you face with, with Callard's uh, suggestion of aspiration, it is not clear to me the role of this question of aspiration in color, because if the solution is, is the Klempler, I think you do not need the aspiration. <laughs> you do not need the role of aspiration. If <laughs> the solution is not the Klempler, then aspiration, <laughs> I would say, is not, uh, is not enough. But I think that there is a, another problem for Fichte there, and which is not uh, easy to solve, because uh, the problem of Fichte is the content of consciousness. You know, what I do have and what I do not have. And if I do not have in my horizon, so to speak, as a subject, something which goes beyond drives, natural drives and desires, it is not clear to me in your reconstruction how I go beyond these drives and desires. This suggestion of exemplars, and here there is another question which I try to, 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 to mention at once, but the solution through the exemplars would presuppose that I do already have this kind of content in my consciousness, but I do not have it. So that it is, I think, not a solution. I suggest that maybe much more than exemplars which in fact Fichte mentions, your quotation is clear and I think completely convincing in the sense that, that Fichte stresses this point. But I think that, uh, and I would say also that this reference to exemplars sounds a bit uh, contemporary, like contemporary exemplarism eh? of Linda Zangsevsky, for example. I do not know if you, if you have thought to, to, to this kind of reference. No? There is a strong, uh, very a la mode now uh, 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 position in virtual ethics, which is moral exemplarism, and which is grounded exactly upon this kind of, this kind of, of uh, uh, idea of morality, that is morality is mainly grounded upon exemplars. But uh, I suggest that much, that much more than exemplars also because the development of the system of ethics is towards a theory of society. A theory of society as a theory of communication and of, society, and of uh, ethical life, I, I, I think. That education and intersubjectivity, but not in the sense, or at least not only or not mainly in the sense of exemplars, can play a role in this sense. And even it seems to me that even in the section uh, uh, 16, there is a suggestion in this, in this direction, 
uh, when when Fichter writes, I, I have the the the, the, the Brazil uh, edition. It is through education that is through the influence through the influence of society in general upon us that we are first cultivated in a manner that makes it possible for us to imply our freedom. This is for uh, for one hundred eighty four in your in your in the edition of the of the sun, um, and I suggest that maybe that this direction is more fruitful in comparison with the direction of the examples. Also because there is the question of heteronomy. And the examples seems to me more dangerous in this sense than the question of the education and Fichte stresses uh, uh, education in the Rousseauian sense. That is education as education to self-determination. Um, then just two last remarks. The first, the will. <laughs> Because you, uh, the, the section 14, where when Fichte speaks of the will, and he speaks, in fact, of the something which seems libertas indifferentia, freedom of indifference of the tradition, that is the, the solution of what we wear, so to speak. Which role does the will play in your reconstruction? Because <laughs> intellectualism, of course, but the will has any way to, 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 to play some role, uh, I think. At least, at least I decide to reflect, of course, and this is maybe the solution and maybe this is the right solution. And the, the last question does concern the pathology of the hero. And uh, I find it very interesting because it is completely, uh, and uh, not completely understandable the rule of this uh, 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 discussion and Fichte's uh, pages. Because if this part were not there, the, the, from the systematic point of view, we do not have, we would not have any difficulty, I think. And this, this figure of the hero, this step, I agree that it is not necessary. Of course, I would say it, it cannot be necessary. But I think that there is a certain ambiguity of the figure of the hero because Fichte writes that it is not moral, but it is better than human beings that uh, look only for their uh, 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 happiness. At least somewhere he writes something of this, uh, of this kind. The, uh, and uh, uh, there is a kind of admiration for the hero. And this is understandable in a certain sense, but, but I would like to know uh, uh, or to, to hear uh, if you do have any suggestion concerning this figure, which is a very peculiar one in this uh, discussion of, of, uh, of the moral way of, ways of thinking in Fichte, and which is also <laughs> something which we cannot find elsewhere. Well, thank you very much. And I, I appreciated a lot this, this paper. Thank you, Luca, for your very interesting and challenging uh, comments. Uh, I think there is a lot in there, uh, so I don't know how you want to handle this. Uh, I guess one of you will begin, and then the other will maybe. So you, yeah. Do you want us to respond to the? If you could briefly respond, oh, yeah. yes. Maybe we could partition the. the I mean, there's some um, there's some points that I immediately wanted to say something about, and but I don't know about you, Karin. So. Yeah to say about questions one and two, you know, evil and um, examples and intersubjectivity, I have less to say immediately about the question of the will and the hero. Um, okay. I could say yeah. something about Yeah, so please, please do not try to be, you know, uh, yeah. uh, exhaustive because we can also come back to certain issues uh, during the Q&A. Right. Okay. So why don't, why don't I just start? <laughs> yeah, with go ahead and start and then yeah. I will, yeah. So maybe I'll start with the second question about, um, you know, what role ex exactly exemplars play and whether Callard's view is necessary. Um, you know, so Callard, um, she's coming from a kind of Aristotelian background. Um, and she actually does say, you know, further in the book that um, we can't aspire on our own, that we need sort of examples or um, sort of some sort of education from others in order to be acquired to acquire these um, you know new new desires new preferences 
and that's, you know, I think that's a very kind of classical Aristotelian idea, right? That how can I um, become virtuous if I'm not already virtuous? And Aristotle th says, well, because somebody in a sense sort of tells you <laughs> what the virtuous thing to do is first and then through habituation, you start to do the right thing with the right responses and emotions and, and things like that, no? So I think that um, <clears throat> um, Fichte is making a move like that. Um, but concerning your question about whether, you know, something like education or intersubjectivity wouldn't be a more helpful way to explain, you know, what is happening or how moral transformation is possible. Um, one thing that we didn't, you know, write in this version of the paper that, but that we've discussed is whether, you know, this um, perceiving of an example, of, of an exemplar and responding to it in a certain way is some sort of a version of the summons. Um, <clears throat> right, that it's a classical kind of fictive idea that in order for reflective self, that, that intersubjectivity and a summons is a condition of possibility for reflective self-consciousness. And we, we think that the, you know, perceiving the exemplar is in some sense, you know, what is happening there is that the exemplar presents you some end um, that you ought to have and you accept that end as one that you should have yourself. And that kind of generates a certain consciousness of yourself. Um, so I think that I don't see, you know, intersubjectivity and education as playing a very different role from the one that I think we're trying to explain through the idea of um, perceiving an, an exemplar and responding to it. What I think is interesting is, and I think that you were alluding to, to this point that it seems like, you know, one could ask, well, why do you respond? <laughs> Um, in a certain way to an exemplar, right? What, what, what makes you receptive to the sort of dispositions or that the example is presenting to you? And I think Fichte's answer to that is that there is sort of something, you know, this is part of our argument that there is sort of already um, some implicit commitment to the moral end that makes you receptive to that, exam to that example. Um, and maybe I'll let Julia see if she wants to add something about this question or others. I would like to say something about other questions. So you can just go ahead. Okay. Well, I was going to turn to the question about evil. Do you want mm -hmm. to say something about that one first, if you have? Uh, yeah, I want to say something about evil, but you can start and then I will just okay. take it from there. Um, so maybe just um, about your point that it seems like uh, Fichte has this very intellectualist conception of evil. I think we absolutely agree. <laughs> you know, that it's interesting that he says um, that evil does seem in some way to be, <clears throat> or that he does seem to think that if you sort of um, understand in some sense what you, what you are <laughs> and the ends that should govern you, you will sort of immediately <laughs> um, be, be, be disposed to act in light of those you know, or to adopt those. Um, and so, yeah, maybe I, I don't have much more to say to that than um, that it does, you know, one thing that is, of course, very different in, in Fichte is positing this idea of like inertia as a sort of natural force that we share in some sense with all other um, natural creatures. Um, <clears throat> Owen has, you know, this long kind of um, discussion of whether that um, means that we're not in some sense responsible for, um, for evil. I don't really see why that would be the case because even if Fichte says that um, the force of inertia is something natural, you know, that we get out of it is not something natural. <laughs> so I'm not sure why, why there's really an issue there. Um, but Julia, maybe I can turn it to you now. Yeah, so uh, on the on the question of evil, so I agree with you that it's in some sense a weak conception of evil. I mean, not as you said, not conceptually weak, but in the sense of the phenomenon. Um, I agree, but it's also incredibly elegant conception of evil because he thereby gets rid of the problems that Kant faces, you know, the problem of how is it, I mean, how is, ev how is evil to be explained if it's supposed to be, to consist in a choice because First of all, why would anyone ever choose evil rather than, uh, than good on a Kantian account? 
And second of all, um, if it's grounded in a maxim, so how can somebody, I mean, how, I mean, how can, how would it ever be possible to, to become a better person if your choice is grounded in a fundamental maxim to be evil? And how would you ever then be able to deviate from that? So I think um, the Kantian account has problems that the Fichtian account gets rid of. But of course, then he might face the, 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 the problem that on his account, evil is ultimately something that we're not responsible for. And that, of course, would be problematic, potentially. Um, because if, if we put it like, as you suggested, that we say it's ultimately a kind of evil um, um, is grounded in some kind of intellectual weakness or you know, reflective failure of reflection. Um, then can we still say that we're responsible for evil or is it just, you know, I mean, if somebody fails to reflect to what extent are they responsible for that or not? And that I think relates to the question of the will, which I also want to talk about and whether or not reflecting is an act of will for Fichte. So I will come to that. Do you want to say something more, Karin? Um, I can add to what you say about okay. that. Um, so yeah, thanks again for those wonderful comments. They were really challenging and, and interesting. So it's great. Um, so one thing that I was immediately drawn to comment on was this the question about the will. So, and, and you mentioned section 14 in which Fichte also speaks about the will and the freedom of indifference. And I think it's very important upfront to note that Fichte prefers to not speak of the will, but rather of wollen, right? So he doesn't speak of wille, but wollen. So, and I think when he speaks about the will in section 14, I think I should close my window because there's a strong rain coming down and it's getting very noisy. This is what I said earlier about raining here every day. So no, here we go again. Um, so when he speaks about the will in section 14, I think he's actually voicing Reinhold's position. He's commenting on Reinhold's position. And of course for Reinhold, there is such a thing as the will as a kind of disposition or, or faculty of potentiality. And I think for Fichte it's very important that the will does not really exist independently of particular acts of willing, wollen. And I think that's, so that's an important aspect of Fichte's methodology in general, that whenever he talks about the self, there's always this element of actuality. It's almost like, and I, I always think of it as a kind of Cartesian thought, that the self is both thinking and reality. So in a way, the self is always already there once it, <laughs> once it has thought itself. So there's this kind of, this, this, this aspect of objectivity and actuality to the self. And one of the, one of the instances where this becomes obvious is when Fichte talks about wollen, and he says that there's a sense in which we find ourselves. You know, this is the first paragraph one in the Sittenlehre. The self finds itself as wollen. So it's not that we, we're in the state of indifference and we're kind of choosing, should we go this way or that way? No, we find ourselves as wollen. So we're already willing. So I think that's, that's very important for his understanding of wollen, uh, that it's, it has this actuality, which is somehow unhintergeber, you know, it's always already there. And that's also the reason why I would be hesitant to say that reflecting is an act of will for Fichte. I think it is not because if it were, then it would have to be, well, <laughs> I mean, I would rather say it's a, maybe it's an episode of wollen, like it's a, it, it, it does involve some kind of willing, but it's not, it's not that we, as it were, can put ourselves in a state where we decide whether we should reflect or not, and then make a choice and then carry out the act of reflection. So it's somehow, it's more immediate and more fundamental act of reflection. And so, and that's why I think Fichte would definitely want to say that we are free in carrying out the act of reflection, but I think he would not want to say that it's an act, um, that we have a choice whether to reflect or not. And the question is now whether that is still sufficient to give us an idea of something like responsibility, whether we're still responsible for carrying out the, the act of reflection or not. But on the other hand, I mean, I might also add that when he talks about evil, his idea is not so much um, I mean, evil, in order not to be evil, we have to continuously reflect. So the question is about continuing to reflect rather than carrying out the, the, the act of reflection in the first place. So it's kind of an ongoing effort 
And one might say that here, when it comes to, as it were, maintaining or sustaining a level of reflection rather than first reaching it, the idea of agency and, and willing becomes more um, important. Mm -hmm. Did you want yeah. to say Okay, so, so maybe, uh, Karin, I don't know if you want to, uh, to make a kind of a final uh, comment yeah. before we go to the uh, Q&A. Yeah. I mean, maybe I'll just briefly add to that, that I think, you know, one, one thing I have, I've really started to develop in a different paper, it hasn't been published, so I can't, you know, point to it yet, um, um, is I, I also think that Fichte is working with a kind of perfectionist conception of the will, according to which sort of um, the free will is really sort of the moral will, you know? So he, when, we're, when we're reflecting, we're free. <laughs> We're, you know, we're, we're freely reflecting, but that's not yet sort of his conception of the free will. The free will is sort of like the perfected will that, um, you know, emerges through at the end of this process of moral development. So I think one could, again, I agree with Julia that in section 14, he's sort of um, alluding or referring to Reinhold, but not so much speaking in his own way, in his own voice when he speaks about freedom of choice, but that he does have a sort of perfectionist conception of the will that is what emerges after, at the end of this process of moral development. But that, you know, that doesn't, um, that when we're reflecting that that's still freedom, it's just not, you know, freedom of choice or the freedom of the will in the way that Kant might speak about it. Um, that we can now maybe like open it up for questions from other people. Thank you, thank you for, for, for really interesting thoughts. Um, I realized that we didn't get to the pathology of the hero, but maybe we can get back to that. Well, I don't think that heroes are that important. <laughs> Let's say, so, can, can I just say one word? I think I always I always think of Schiller at this point. I always think of the Räuber. I don't know if Fichte had had this in mind, but this is what it always reminds me of. So just as a footnote. Okay, so um, I think we can indeed now um, uh, open the floor. So uh, who would like to ask a question? Since we are a small group, I think people can simply raise their hand or or start talking. Pavel, please. Uh, yeah, thanks very much for the for the paper and the and the response. Um, so I have a question about a complicated topic. I guess the is the relation between these these stages that you talked about at the ideal or transcendental level or a priori level, what do you want to call it, and the real or factual or empirical development and the way that they um, connect up together. So I think you mentioned that there is a real or a factual corresponding development to um, these, these sort of stages. Um, I guess I wanted to ask what, what exactly that means. Um, does it mean, for example, that I can, I can have empirical cognition or I can know what stage I'm in? Um, and if not, in what sense is, is there an, an, a corresponding empirical development um kind of the background of my question is the the, the a later a later um lecture by fichte the i think it's called the characteristics of the present age where he kind of tackles this problem in a different context it's another one of the histories that luca mentioned i think of consciousness um and there he says um yeah you have these a priori stages but empirically you can't know which stage you're in you can you can just kind of guess because he wants to keep those two levels apart so it seems that the the relation of these two seems to be a bit a bit different there. So I guess I just wanted to ask about that, um, how it works in the in the in the moral case. So do you want to start? Mm -hmm. So um, so the reason why we made that distinction was um, just to to draw attention to the fact that Fichte is here not just analyzing something that is in reality um, uh, unified. I mean this is. Part of his methodology in the Sittenlehre that he often looks at the phenomena and he says it's really a synthesis of two, let's say, opposite or different uh, elements, but I'm going to analyze them successively just in order to clarify what, what the phenomenon is. But then, and then he says, but we have to think them together. So this is not um, an, an actual sequence in time, it's just an analytical sequence. And we wanted to say that when he speaks about moral transformation or development, he actually does speak about uh, 
more than just an analytical sequence, but rather something that does unfold in time. I mean, it may still be the case that um, empirically it's difficult, if not impossible, to know which stage one a particular individual is on. But the important point from our, I mean, the, the, the important aspect that we wanted to point out here was that there is a kind of succession going on rather than just an analytical, um, you know, yeah. It's, so it's, it's a real succession rather than just an analytical succession. Yeah, I, I, I agree with what Julia said, but I think, you know, I, all, I, I, I probably do think that, you know, as with many of Fichte's works, <laughs> Um, he presents him as a kind of like guide, right? That he's wanting his readers to sort of reflect on how they see themselves um, in these different stages. And that he's trying to kind of like prompt when he's presenting these stages, a question to you, like, okay, which, which stage are you at? Um, and um, do, does, can even my work serve as something like an exemplar for you, um, right? If you are at a lower stage, can even reading this sort of developmental process prompting you sort of the desire to be at a higher stage of moral development. Okay. Uh, Luciano? Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you very much for the for the paper. It was um, very interesting. So my, I guess my question is a kind of clarificatory question concerning, let's say, the Kantian counterpart that you used uh, all along, so like you began by distinguishing, say, Fichte an account of of freedom as based on reflection, the Kantian account as based on on choice, and I was wondering whether there might not be, let's say, more similarities um, than um, than let's say differences, or at least whether Kant has to be that committed to an idea of choice. I, I mean, I'm thinking of. Uh, paragraph four of the Metaphysics of Morals of the introduction, where he says that like one cannot explain freedom with uh, virtue, with choosing for or against the law, and that that's really a, a, an unvermögen, uh, a vermögen, that freedom is really referred to the inner law, is something like that. so. Like, and then also I don't know, maybe also in the critique of practical reason, one could say it is not really about choice, uh, I mean, that choice is also less prominent in that regard. So I was wondering whether, let's say, you could clarify a bit more this Kantian counterpart. Uh, um, yeah, so th that's the, the question. Thank you. Um, yeah. So, I mean, this is a question that we we had got before specifically about this um, the passage from religion that we also talked about, um, where uh, the suggestion was, well, I mean, maybe we shouldn't think of Kant as advocating for this idea that freedom is ultimately grounded in choice because he's he's fully aware of the fact if we did that, then freedom would be a problematic concept that involves some kind of infinite regress, right? So isn't that, couldn't you read that as some kind of reductio argument in Kant? Um, and I mean, I agree that one might maybe push Kant in that direction, but at least on the face of it, the idea that freedom does involve willkür and hence the capacity to choice, for choice, does seem to be very important for Kant. And then um, the question is whether Fichte, um, the question is whether that is the, the opponent that Fichte takes himself to be arguing against, or that, that Fichte thinks that his view can maybe usefully be contrasted with or not. And so even if it turned out that Kant on a more kind of more benevolent reading is actually not fundamentally committed to the idea of choice, it might still be that Fichte thinks that, that that's an important aspect of Kant's view. And because I think also because he's very much concerned with this, um, with this Reinholdian problem. Of how can we understand freedom uh, such that it's neither some kind of indifference and indeterminism, uh, nor some kind of problematic determinism, right? So that is, that, that is, the, the, that is one of the problems that he's addressing. Mm -hmm. um, so maybe then you could say, well, um, Maybe he's not the opponent is so not so much Kant himself, 
but certain readings of Kant that think that um, Kant has to be, Kant's conception of freedom has to be construed such that it involves a very strong um, as element of, of choice, such as the Reinholdian one. And of course, if you think of, uh, if you view it from that point of view, then the alternative would be something like intelligible fatalism, like the Schmidt position, which is also something that Fichte, um, that Fichte references. And um, it seems like he is thinking of his position as being able to find a third option that avoids the problem of both this kind of Reinholdian position and uh, the determinist um, fatalist conception of freedom. Mm-hmm. And then of course, there is an open question where Kant would, where, I mean, if we, yeah, where, where Kant would be placed within that um, landscape. But so maybe more carefully, we should say certain readings of Kant rather than Kant himself. Yeah, maybe I'll just add uh, to, to your question. I'm not exactly sure, you know, what, um, how you think the passage of the metaphysics of morals that you were referring to sort of supports a view of Kant as kind of different from this idea of freedom as choice, because I think there he's just rejecting Reinhold's idea that, um, you know, freedom consists in the capacity to will for against the moral law, right? Um, Which seems sort of different from the position in the, in religion in some sense. Um, But I think, you know, if you think of the Fichtian position, it, it does seem quite different, right? He says, your ends, even the you know before they're conceptualized, are determined by your drive, and you can't really you know. In some sense, you can distance yourself from your drive when you reflect on that, and that's sort of a conceptualization of the drive that gives you that results in a kind of end and perhaps a new end. But at no point are you kind of completely free <laughs> to choose one one drive rather than than another. If you reflect, he says, it will immediately, you know, you'll go on to a different stage. And so, you know, reflection is free, whether you reflect is free, but what happens, he could, you know, he repeatedly says, it's expected that this will happen. If you reflect, then immediately, you know, you will um, adopt this new, these new ends. So it seems like in the background, he has this sort of like very deterministic picture, (laughs) you know, which he very early in life was kind of committed to. But nonetheless, you know, um, there's this sort of element of, of freedom and spontaneity because nothing ex- explains whether you will reflect or not. Nothing determines whether you will reflect or not. And that, that seems to me quite different. Um, and I, you know, Julia mentioned this, like perhaps reading of, uh, sorry, of Kant where, well, given that it does lead in this, into this infinite regress, maybe that couldn't have been Kant's view. But I really just nowhere see Kant himself alluding to, to, to something like that. He does seem to think that it's a problem and that that's why freedom is just inexplicable. <clears throat> okay, uh, Luis, please. Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, thank you for the paper. It was, uh, it was very, very interesting. And uh, I have a very, very general question. Uh, I, I, I was, wondering listening to the paper uh, that this presentation makes uh, Fichte uh, or makes it understandable that for Fichte pedagogy plays uh, a very important role and even more important than it plays uh, for Kant uh, education pedagogy and so on and I was just wondering if you think that perhaps uh, engaging a little bit further with the vocation of the scholar and with education and so on if it could perhaps uh, help dealing with problems such as the uh, infinite regress and the incomprehensibility of moral development and uh, and so on. I know that you uh, use this notion of example, which is uh, also very, uh, very interesting. And I would just like to mention that in Fichte's uh, lectures on the vacation of the scholar of 1811, he will explicit deal with the notion of example in the context of of pedagogy and education and so on. Uh, So I I was just wondering if you think that it would perhaps uh, help dealing with those uh, problems. Uh, Do you mean mean in Fichte or in Kant? In the context of uh, of the paper. Uh, So the, the problem of the incomprehensibility of moral development or the problem of the infinite regress if we take into account these uh, pedagogical or learning processes uh, 
in the context of society or in the context or in the context of the university or in the context of the relation between a professor and a student and, and so on, if you think it could contribute to deal with those questions? I mean, in, in a sense, I think that's that's one of the main claims of the of the paper. Okay. Right? That um, that Fichte's solution to sort of the puzzle of self-transformation is that actually self-transformation is not possible. That we only, you know, can have self-transformation if, if we have some stimulus from the outside that perhaps just sort of like generates some awareness or some, you know, implicit knowledge that we have already of what we ought to be, but that that, come, that cannot come from inside, Fichte says. No, so yeah, very much. That he says that a certain sort of self-consciousness and moral development isn't possible without, you know, without exposure to certain moral examples. You know, so, you know, both he has, you know, a number of times these, um, I was just at a conference on soci sociality and German ideals in, mo in modern Jewish thought. Um, and we were looking at, you know, um, passages where Fichte repeatedly says, you know, no I without a thou, mm -hmm. um, which is also kind of a, a prominent theme in, in Buber and in other Jewish thinkers. So I would maybe want to add that to say that self-transformation is not possible is maybe a bit strong because there's of course a sense in which the transformation doesn't happen or the development or the process of maturation doesn't happen unless the self does something that brings it about right. by themselves. But I think uh, this, this issue of pedagogy and education is really interesting, especially also in comparison to Kant because I mean, we can, on our reading, it's kind of, it's understandable why Fichte, why moral education is such a big deal for Fichte and why it's so important for him in contrast to the, for Kant. I mean, Kant has a view of moral education, but it was always a bit puzzling how, how that can play such an important role for him because of course he believes there's a sense in which our awareness of the moral law is just a given and we all have to have it anyway. And, you know, so how can it be educated? But then Fichte, we can see, um, I mean, on our reading, how it is that once you've reflected, you've reflected, you've kind of, as it were, prepared yourself for more um, development and education. But then there's still something to be done through genuine moral education. And on our reading, at least, that's what's what's still to be done. That doesn't in the least interfere with the subject's freedom because. The, the, the subject has already carried out the fundamental act of freedom by reflecting on the drive. That's something that only she can do and that cannot be grounded in anything outside. But then there's still something, some genuine work to be done, namely the, the work of enlightening the subject about her genuine her drive. I mean, this goes back to a question that Luca also raised. How is it that we can have a drive and not be aware of it? I think that's an interesting question. But um, so, but in any case, then the idea would be there's still some general work to be done through education. But that doesn't interfere with the subject freedom because she has already carried out this fundamental act of freedom through reflection. So it's a quite different um, uh, uh, understanding of where and how moral education comes in than uh, in Kant, I think. Um, yeah. Maybe I'll just say something that I think, you know, even though we've been sort of stressing that it seems like, you know, Kant is very different in the sense that he starts from, you know, the fact of being aware of the moral law. Um, I do think that it's interesting that in the analytic of the second critique, um, you know, he provides this sort of example of like um, a man, you know, that he says, if you, um, would you be willing to give false testimony against, you know, if the king told you that they would hang you if you don't give false testimony. And so he's kind of providing examples of situations that are kind of trying to generate a certain moral awareness in you. you know, so I think places like that are places where one could look to Kant, you know, to try, and, to, try to um, get something like what Fichte is more explicitly developing um, of trying to kind of generate this sort of self-awareness in education. I mean, the importance of education also plays on, into this idea of freedom as reflection and also what Luca mentioned that it is this kind of cognitive mm -hmm. conception of freedom and also evil and, and, and the opposite of evil. And that's a very important idea in Fichte, of course, that um, education is really crucial in order to, for, for us to, to become a mature moral agent. And, and in particular, something like cognitive education, you know, that we have, that we become better at reflecting and um, that we educate our cognitive faculties. 
Okay, um, uh, Francesco, I was wondering if you want to ask a question, but you have turned off your um, your video. I'm not sure. Do you have a question? Uh, hello, no, that was very interesting, but um, I don't have any question at the moment. Okay, 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 that's perfectly fine, of course. So I have a question um, to the two of you because um, I think that you all, during your talk and maybe also during the discussion, the focus has been on. Um, uh, let's say the more existential level of the individual who can or cannot um, go through certain stages in order to develop morally. And on the other hand, the perspective of the philosopher. Mm -hmm. uh, but um, um, I'm not a specialist, but given you know a more Hegelian perspective, I, I was wondering whether um, the, um, the account is not somewhat overlooking the artificiality of it all. And the fact that that Fichte um, stages uh, a certain um, development uh, of which he knows from the very start what is going to be the outcome. Um, and uh, another maybe related point is that that what you maybe did not really um, address is the is the point that Fichte wants in this particular way to develop a system of ethical thought. That is to say, a kind of comprehensive account of all possible determinations um, of ethical life. Yes, that can be instantiated in one way or another. Uh, at the uh, empirical or existential level, um, and and so another related point is maybe um, what you th what you think of this idea that Fichte um, um, uses some type of transcendental arguments, as you pointed out at the beginning, uh, in order to, as it were, um, identify the sum total of conditions or determinations that, um, that are possible within this particular sphere of ethical life. Yeah, so, so I, I don't know. Um, I mean, in a sense, Please, in a sense, it seems like your questions are versions of the same question. Yes, I think so. Because yeah. you're saying the artificiality of it is connected to the idea that there's supposed to be a kind of system yeah. And there's a certain link between them. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> and, and the transcendental argument is just showing that um, the relation yes. implication between different concepts. No. Yeah, or how, how does the way you in which you proceed in order to you know, identify the sum to total of determinations of ethical life or, or, or conditions under which um, well, actual agents can, can behave morally. Mm -hmm. But I'm not sure, so I'm not sure exactly what, what your question is. You, you seem to think that there's some problem with that. Um, no, that I think, I think it's, I think it's, um, I don't, I don't think there is a problem, but I, I somehow feel that you did not really emphasize this, this, right. this, this level of Fichte's methodology and his aim to, as it were, generate mm -hmm. um, the sum total of determinations uh, of ethical life. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and, and, and that that maybe this this is more this was more important to Fichte than um, you know telling people how to um, uh, improve morally. Yeah, even though this might as might as well have been one of his motives. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that that's that's an excellent suggestion, <laughs> and I think I'll just I'll just take that as something that it would be helpful to you know. I think, you know, initially when we were writing the paper, we were, we were just really struck by these passages where he talks about um, what we saw as kind of, kind of like a puzzle of self-transformation. And then we saw, well, actually, from the, from the perspective of the philosopher, there is no puzzle. It's very clear how, how these stages should happen. You know? And so then we were um, trying to see, you know, these different perspectives. Um, but I think maybe something that we could do in a future version of this paper is um, perhaps um, add to our central thesis 
um, that um, this conception of moral development and freedom is part of a sort of the idea that the system of ethics is a system of ethics um, and that that's part of one of his motivations. Mm -hmm. um, although when, when you were asking your question, Karen, you seem to say that there's a certain kind of Hegelian criticism of artificiality. I, I wasn't sure what oh. you were no, I, I didn't. I, I didn't mean it this way. I, I, um, it's just that that I know uh, Hegel better than I know uh, Fichte, so I was kind of projecting what I know um, about Hegel onto Fichte's text, but not at all as a criticism. I think, on the contrary, yes, because I think that this uh, this this effort to develop uh, a kind of you know comprehensive system. Um, uh, well, I find very strong and 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 interesting. I, but I, I so I, I I like that question. Oh, maybe I I don't. Know. So it has alerted me to a potential problem. And um, okay, sorry, I have to adjust. The weather is very turbulent over here. So it has alerted me to a potential problem. If I understand you correctly, then one might object to Fichte. Well, but how do you know and how you just how do you justify your standpoint, kind of your higher standpoint as a philosopher. I mean, how do you, you know, it's all good and well to tell us about these transcendental conditions and the completement of the process of moral maturation, but where do you, I mean, where, how do you derive, I mean, how do you justify the fact that you can occupy the standpoint? Yeah. And, um, and that's uh, actually a point where one might want to turn to Hegel and look at the phenomenology, for instance, and. And, and, and feel the need to provide some kind of historical account of, uh, and of the genealogy of the standpoint, which Fichte doesn't provide. And that may be raised as an objection to his account, I suppose. Well, also, I, I'm, I'm not too sure if, so, as, I'm not too sure if, there, if there's a big difference between Fichte and Hegel in this regard. So I think that, that Fichte, what Fichte brings into play is this, uh, uh, idea that the human being strives towards absolute self-dependence, and 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 so this is this is as it were a kind of assumption that he brings into play, and that allows him to to get everything going and to develop all these determinations until you get at the highest uh, type of this uh, self-determination, I guess, and that as it were confirms the. Um, um, the 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 right, the, right. The, that that confirms that the original assumption or hypothesis was the right one yes right. because it allows him to uh to to bring everything uh, to completion mm -hmm. and i don't think that hegel has a better way to uh to proceed mm -hmm. Yeah, I think when we, you know, we were meeting to talk about, you know, exactly in what sense we want to spell out the idea that the moral end is presupposed, you know, by the very initial act of reflection. And I think the way that we were thinking about it is along the lines of what you're saying now, Karen, know that maybe the subject sort of, in some sense, is trying to satisfy a longing or drive through first, you know, getting enjoyment or pleasure or things like that. And they realize that that doesn't quite satisfy them. So that indicates that there must be some other possible drive that they have. And then they try to do something else Well, this sort of heroic drive. And they, they realize that that doesn't quite satisfy them until they arrive at like the proper moral end or something. Yeah. 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 And I think that's really, you know, that's a kind of dialectic and, and really pro-Hegelian, uh, a proto-Hegelian. And, and well, that's, that's, that's an aspect that I find very interesting personally. No, yeah. thank, you. Yeah. thank you for that idea. I think we'll we'll definitely take it into you know, the version that we'll continue to work on. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, so maybe at this point I, I conclude the final part as I usually do. So I'd like to thank uh, Julia and Karen for their very interesting talk and the discussion. And of course, also Luca von Su for his uh, interesting comments and everyone else for uh, particip having participated in this discussion. Uh, so uh, let's uh, thank everyone, and thank you. Um, and then I think that uh, off record we can also uh, have a further chat. Yeah, sure. <laughs> sure. Thank you so much yeah. for inviting us, Karen. This was, you know, a really nice opportunity. Also, you know, 
um, just to work on something together. And I always actually prefer like more intimate settings to get better conversation, better feedback that way. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. really, really nice. yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. 